to pull on that kind of, because you mentioned it, COVID, I want to talk about technology in terms of mental mental wellness first, because when, when you talked about that routine, that structure, making sure that you have things in your schedule that fill you up, I know that there would be a lot of people in their early 20s that would say, well, scrolling on Instagram for an hour and a half today, that was what I did to fill me up. But really, it's more of a distraction there's this idea of, there's this disconnection between understanding what exactly it is that nourishes the soul and makes you feel well, right? Like we don't know we need social connection. We might not have had it in a while. We might feel a little awkward about, you know, being part of a group outside of my house. So when I think about taking care of my mental health, I think about spending time on my devices where I feel the most safe as opposed to challenging myself. Do you see that? in the generation that, that you're in and, and how do you fight against it? Because these devices are extremely charming. They're extremely yeah. enticing. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know how I, I deal with it. Personally, I, I do also get burnt out by social media sometimes. So um, I don't have a routine in terms of taking time off from my phone or social media, but I do have moments where I notice and recognize that I need to take a break. But uh, I do I do think that's that's a, a fair assumption or a fair uh, assessment of uh, people my age in terms of like scrolling on, on social media or being on their phones as a way to uh, fill, fill their time or even rest. But um, I think it also just shows how much there is a, a longing or that desire to connect with other people as well. Um, I think technology gives us a, a sense of connection, um, how, wh however you you want to define connection, but it gives us a sense that we're connecting with other people and we're engaging with them. Um, but I, I do think that it's, for me, it doesn't fill me. I don't think it, it, it gives the same uh, kind of connection it does with a real human connection or real human interaction. But um, it is something that's very prevalent among young people. And unfortunately, I don't know if it's seen as a good, th a, a, a bad thing. I think it's something that most people my age are not trying to change. It's more of how we do things, you know? Yeah, it's it's just the normative trend. Whereas yeah. if you went to a dinner party with people in my age group, which is early 40s, if you went to a dinner party and someone was on their phone the, during the dinner party, sitting at the, at the dinner table and had their phone out, that would be seen as non-normative, not normal. And it wouldn't be something we were used to. And so we would probably point that out and the person would would not do it. Whereas would it be a fair characterization to say that there are dinners that you go out with people in your 20s and at some point in the meal, everyone's on their phone and that's just a normal a normal component of that kind of a, of a, of a, of a gathering. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And I do that too, to be honest. Um, I do know that uh, older generations are not big fans of that, but I do see it as a thing that we do because even like parents have to remind children or my parents have to remind us like no no, no phones at the table right now. We're eating as a family or doing whatever it might be. But um, for sure, it is, it, is, it is a big thing among people my age. But that's fascinating that you point out that it's not something within the age group. It seems as though what you're saying is those behaviors are not being called out as being socially taboo within the age group. It's it's other generations that are pointing it out, but with when you're together and and with with a group of people who all think of that as being something that they want to do, it's almost like, oh, ha, great. There's no old people here who are going to tell us to get off our phones. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think uh, we do recognize it, we do see it, but um, we're more we're more open to it, uh, and it's not like in the middle of a conversation, I'll pick up my phone and start texting. It's in those moments when maybe the conversation is dying down or nothing's being said as much. That's when you'll see somebody pick up their phone and start using it or a, a number of people using it. It's true. And there's research out there, which is really fascinating around the idea of boredom and, mm -hmm. you know, boredom and imagination. So when we were younger, then we had no devices and we weren't allowed to watch TV. We were bored by our parents would be like, hey, go outside, go do something, you know? And you'd have to like make up games and you would have imaginary friends and you would, you would, you know, put skits together or whatever. And so there is some magic in boredom. And that's some, one of the things that I'm a little nervous about in the new generations where with there's no 
there's no time for your brain to be as creative and imaginative when you're bored and there's an immediate distraction on a on a device where your brain goes in a very passive consumption um yeah. mode i see what you're saying because if you take the ttc for example just look around everybody has a pair of these like a pair of these headphones or airpods or whatever it might be um that's something i, I recognize for myself as well um i think i could I, I could take more time when i'm trying to think through things or maybe come up with an idea whether it's for work or school or whatever it might be i just try to go to to, to just erase all sound or all noise around me because I noticed that it's hard to just sit in a room by myself for an extended period of time, unless it's intentional. It's always hard. To, I always I'm listening to something, I'm playing something on my laptop, as I'm, you know, fixing something in my room or whatever it might be. So I do agree with that. There's a lot of consumption, a lot of media consumption going on here. These highly, highly stimulating environments now. This kind of hyper stimulation. Um, mm -hmm. And again, and and we're not built like our bodies, you know. We were li we lived in nature and we had nature sounds and you know we didn't have always constant stimulation and our bodies also nervous systems don't really know what to do with themselves when we're constantly bombarded with sounds. Um, but let's do it. Let's take this. Let's take this technology train and let's drive it into the COVID station, okay, Manzi? Because the education you did two years, two years during the COVID pandemic where you were taking classes. Yeah, yeah, it was like a year. Yeah, actually, two years. Yeah. Yeah, 2020 more and like 2020. A year and a half, more, more like a year and a half, because 2021 things, I think, were opening up a bit. So some of the classes were in person. And so what I want to dive into now is some of these trends we've talked about, self-regulation, being able to manage your time, the influence of technology on our lives, this idea of communication and connection with people. Well, COVID uh, certainly <laughs> changed the way we live. And uh, arguably, we, I mean, physics will dictate, we don't go backwards, right? We're moving forward. So we're not, the reality we had before is no longer our reality. Where we'll end up, who knows? But what I want to talk about with you now is how did that impact your educational experience? First educational, first that teaching and learning experience. And then we'll get into you as a human being trying to um, keep all of these practices and, and and routines in place. But how did teaching and learning change for you in those in those courses that you took during the pandemic? Yeah, um, I think that's where I picked up the the need to just learn on my own. So um, not on my own, but just to have more to, to to take more ownership of my own learning, right? Because some of those lectures, it was hard. It was so hard to just watch like three lectures every day on a laptop and try to stay engaged or listen to everything that they have to say. But um, the, the the instructors also did a good job with recording them. Um, it, it, it took me back to a place of just restructuring and trying to find what works for me in this environment. And um, what technology did it was it, it slowed it slow me down in, in terms of learning, but not in a bad way. It was more like I was more meticulous in how I learned. So, for example, like the recordings of the lectures, I always watched them in two days. It was never just one day, right? So I would watch the first half uh, today, and then I'd watch the second half of it the next day. Um, but the biggest change for me was more uh, about just grasping the content, the learning of material, and just trying to find a way to work with it more individually as opposed to in a group setting. So were you Googling, were you like writing down key concepts, Googling them, like looking at articles that were talking about them, watching other kinds of videos, like trying to trying to kind of flesh out your understanding of topics outside of what was being provided for you in the LMS? Uh, it was more of taking the material given in class or um, whether it's the textbooks or like, like the readings that they give. I would take those, I would read them, then I would watch that half of the lecture, trying to see if, how I'm understanding it is how the professor is trying is explaining it. And then I'd bring that um, back to the text and try to connect, to make the connections with what the professor was saying, go to the tutorials and um, see what the, the teaching assistant is giving. Is that, does that line up with what I thought initially or what the professor said? And just trying to connect the three ways of learning. But it was more about me finding 
my my way of learning and my way of interpreting the content really and did it start born out of frustration like did you try the old way and what was what happened you tried what was the what was the old way and then what did it feel like when you were like oh yeah this isn't gonna work i'm gonna have to re i'm gonna have to figure this out yeah so i at first i was trying to do what we do with the go with the classes just go into the lectures and listen to what the professor is saying and then uh doing the readings but i figured quickly that it wasn't going to work if I was using my laptop, right? Um, maybe it might work for other people, but I'm, I just couldn't sit for two hours in front of my computer and stay engaged and stay as engaged as I was in class. So that's when I was just trying to pass my courses. I was trying to uh, get my grades. So I was just trying to see what ways I could tweak my learning experience to make it fit my uh, my preferences. Okay, so this is fascinating. So it was like, okay, that's too long. My attention span is too is I can't last that long, which is very normal. And then you were like, let me go to a reading. Let me check this out. Let me see if I understand what that reading said. Now let me go back to that chunk of the video, just that bit of the video, not the whole thing. But like, is that what the instructor was saying in regards to that? Okay, cool. Go back to another reading, chunk it out, right? Switch formats, reading, video reading, video, and then also intermingle in there TA office hours or tutorial sessions where you are you got to listen to a real person in real time and ask questions in that way. So those kinds of three modalities, you would break them up, chunk them, and move between them to maintain a level of engagement and also build the knowledge you were looking to build. Exactly. And I would also do that with my courses. So I would do a bit of this course and then a bit of this other course just to keep myself uh, in a you know kind of state where I I'm not just dragging myself through learning. You know? And how did you combat the you know I don't know if you know this but the alcohol sales and COVID went through the roof and people were unhappy and depression and all these things. The 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 difficulty of not getting so much human contact, like doing that work. And staying motivated, like you were working to stay engaged enough to learn and maintain your grades. That in and of itself says you were motivated. And how did you personally stay motivated when the world was shut down? Yeah, um, I wasn't always motivated, to be honest. But I, I, like I said, I'm always just tweaking things, trying to see what works for me or how I can try to make it uh, a, a good experience for myself. So uh, during COVID, I took uh smaller uh just less courses than i usually do so i did that um that was also around the time i got into you know about my interest in video editing and things like that so i was mixing that up with my uh with my learning uh I'll do some video editing or something related to con content creation throughout the day i would do something related to learning i would go outside i had a routine every day at six i would also just go skip my rope do some push-ups something like that um and in the evening for some of that uh for some of that covid period i would i was at i was at home with my parents so i would i would just um spend time with them as well so it was just about juggling things just trying to do as many things as i can to not make myself feel confined by the covid or by the circumstances at the time that's incredible incredible uh wisdom to share with people looking to manage difficult circumstances you really seem to and it, you're speak, you're preaching to the choir in 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 when you're talking to me about the value of routine and structure and to use that as a way of even when you were talking about how you approach school in your mind you understood it as a flow of events I would do this and then I would do this and then I would do this and how that affords freedom more levels of peace like you know what's coming next you 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 have a plan. Because when a world, COVID, what COVID represented for so many of us is uncertainty, right? There was so much uncertainty that was that was in the world and it, whether or not what the state of the world was going to be and whether our own personal health was, was going to be secured. So the value of routine and structure in providing grounding maybe is the right word, like feeling grounded and not flying away and being caught up in the wave of uncertainty and fear and anxiety. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And like you said, we, we, we couldn't tell what was going to happen in the future, but it, at least for the day or for the short term, it was giving you some kind of structure. So you know that 
my day is going is going to look like this. I don't know what the next year is going to look like, but I know for sure tomorrow I'll do this. And that structure is what keeps us going through life. I, I truly believe that as well. Yeah, and it keeps us present, which again speaks to a lot of philosophies, um, both religious and agnostic philosophies on on just uh, wellness in general is staying present. So let's talk about technology and has education a bit more. Like in the future, Manzi, given what you've experienced, because you've, I'm sure now you've experienced a lot of different formats of online learning, blended, a little bit of this online, a little bit of that online. Some people trying to get you to do group work online, uh, discussion forums. In your mind, what do you feel the future of education should look like with technology? Do you think that first year students, for example, should all should have in-person classes because they learn other valuable skills and then then move to online? Or do you feel that online learning is something that um, is so accessible and flexible and beneficial that we should have it available to students um, even in the younger younger years of maybe high school? Yeah. So like you said earlier, well, we're always moving forward, right? We're not going to go back to the way things are. So we're in the past. So I think to try to, you know, take out that aspect of online learning that's fairly new uh, would just not be too, it, it wouldn't serve them the best if, if we're going to, you know, uh, we're trying to create a, a space for the long-term learners. But uh, I do think that in-person learning also has its own benefits. So just finding a way to mix the two, I think hybrid is the answer to that, to be honest, not just one, but both of them, right? And identifying what those values are or what those uh, benefits of in-person learning are and, you know, trying to emphasize them through an in on in-person learning uh, environment, but also having that online learning environment. So for me, I think a high, um, making a hybrid kind of course that has both online and in-person is the answer to that for me. But um, also because of the way things are moving fast, um, I think online asynchronous, I found I found that to be pretty um, good for me, especially in COVID. One of the courses that I took was asynchronous. So the the, the professor, the instructor would re record their portion and then they would give us um, activities to do. And that was the lecture. So it wasn't just listening to her speak. It was listening to, to, to their portion of the class and then re doing the readings and then doing an activity. And it was all those things together. But back to that in-person thing, uh, in-person uh, point, I think um, just have, finding a way to do both. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have like a, a plan of how you can do both of those, but finding a way to just mix both in-person and online learning it would be the answer to that for me. Well, this asynchronous, this, this, this idea of providing a course that is completely online for the flexibility of it, right? Because one of the reasons why people have promoted online learning is because it reduces transit times. People don't have to come to campus. They can work, they can care for elderly parents, and they can also still attend classes. So do you feel that an asynchronous learning experience, do you feel that someone younger, like, because you've talked a lot about an ability, you need to you need to be diligent, you need to be motivated, you need to have structure and routine. So when you talked about that completely asynchronous course, you got a lot out of it because of who you are. Do you feel that asynchronous learning opportunities are well suited to everybody, or who might they not be well suited to? Um, I don't think they're well suited for everybody. I actually have a friend who was telling me how she had a hard time just learning in COVID um, because. Some people like that aspect of being able to talk to peers and being around people as you're learning or having that face-to-face uh, -face contact, with your, whether it's your instructors or your peers. So I, I do think that um, it's not for everyone. I do, I do think that some people succeed more with different styles of learning. So, um, yeah, I, do, I, do, I don't think it's for everybody. It can work for everybody, but it's not the it's not necessarily the preference that everybody has. And I do think for the person who um, likes to learn in a group setting or picks up things faster in a group setting or through discussion, I think that that might not be the best learning style for them. And you've hit the nail on the head in terms of informed decision making, that the key to this is being self-aware, right? If a course is offered in different ways, 
Unfortunately, what we're finding is that students are choosing the asynchronous option just because they think they think it's the most convenient, right? Because they don't have to be anywhere at any specific time. They do things kind of when they want to do things. And that level of freedom is really enticing um, to a lot of students. But then they get into those environments and then they don't necessarily have the skills that they need to succeed in asynchronous learning environments. So informed decision making absolutely would be the way forward about that self-awareness piece. Just this one about hybrid, because again, people are talking about hybridity in different ways now. This idea of, so learning better when you have access to people face-to-face. -face. Well, do you think what we're doing right now is face-to-face? -face? We're synchronous, we're on at the same time, we're in real time right now. Um, we're on a screen, I can see your face. Do you think that having time like this in a course, like an hour and a half each week where you and the instructor and the whole class log on, maybe there's a breakout activity and, and things like that, so there's a synchronous component to the course and then other components are asynchronous. Would you think of that as hybrid and that as beneficial as, as well as the in-person synchronous component? You're on campus, you're in the same room. Does this count for you? Um, it does count. I think it counts, but it, it, it has certain, um, I feel like it poses some risks that wouldn't be there if it was real in, in time, like real time connection with people in the same room as you. I think um it definitely offers that face-to-face -face, um aspect to it like i do think this is face-to-face -face, well in a, in, a, in a digital way but i do think uh for if it's a big group then some people might just kind of fade in the background of the discussions or the learning but uh if it's for small groups i think the the bigger the, the smaller the group the more effective it would be but if the groups just are bigger groups then there's that risk of people just fading out or just not being as engaged with the learning as the, as everybody else. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about where everything is going. And I think we can we can end with some forecasting, Manzi. You know, we come from different generations, um, different educational backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, um, but we both find ourselves in the same world at this moment with all of the disruptions and changes and and devices and and uncertainty. And if you were to put yourself forward, let's just go conservative and say 10 years. So you're, you know, you're in the workforce now, you're looking back. How do you think education is going to continue to evolve and change? It's changed a lot, even in the four years you've been in higher education. It's definitely changed a lot since that local uh, K to eight experience uh, that you had in Kigali, Rwanda. What do you see the next 10 years? What, what will it look like, do you think, the teaching and learning experience? Um, I think I, I do, I've actually thought about this before. I do think that there's going to be a lot more technological advancement. I do think like artificial intelligence is going to be something that's going to be a part of the learning experience. Um, so like right now we're seeing the big issue with chat GPT and how it's kind of caused some changes within learning. I do think that we'll see more artificial intelligence forms of AI just coming to come into the learning, but eventually we're going to have to find a way to merge it into the learning experience. So that's one thing that I do think that is going to be different. Um, there's still going to be more technological um, involvement within the learning process. Uh, but I also do think that learning may, will probably not be as long, will probably not take as long as it does now in terms of like getting a degree program or um, just getting whatever um, whatever you're working for, whether it's a diploma or a degree or whatever it might be, I do think it's gonna take a shorter time because now you see things like people who do like six month cer certificates and they're working in IT or things like that, right? Um, it it probably will be more skills based uh, because yes, yeah, uh, especially in the liberal arts, I think there there'll be a need to incorporate something that has to do with skills or skills training because. Uh, that's, that seems to be what's running the economy, and most young people seem to be um, just going towards that more than uh, just being in class for a set number of years and then going into the workforce. Those are incredibly insightful predictions, Manzi, and I agree with all of them, and I look forward. Hopefully, we're still in contact 10 years from now, and we can check in and see if your predictions have become a reality. I really appreciate the wisdom you shared today. I think a student who has gone through the very chaotic and disrupted uh, last four years of a degree program like you have, 
Um, the insights you offer uh, me as an educator and as a systems designer, but as well to other students who are going through and working with maintaining a level of well being and mental health while also pursuing with incredible dedication and motivation, their academics and their professional careers. You're a real inspiration, Manzi, and I wish you the best of luck as you finish off your fourth year. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, you've been part of my learning experience, so a lot of what I've learned, I've learned from you as well, uh, whether it's through seeing the way you work or just taking things from being around you as well. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure and we'll just keep, we'll keep learning from each other and we'll talk soon. The Education Revolution podcast is produced in-house by community members. And I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Sangara. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and head over to my website to opt in for my newsletter for more ways to connect with some of these big ideas.